Hello, and welcome to The Source Within with Chloe Petalino, where I share the source within me with hopes it sparks the source within thee. And today we're going to discuss some limiting beliefs and how to manage them and how to challenge them. And why is this important? Well, it's important because it gets in the way of us really realizing our full potential and from taking steps towards living the life that we desired. And today I have with me Cindy, who has an incredible amount of experience. Um, she has worked in for 44 years, is that right? In preventative medicine and health and wellness industries. Do I dare admit to that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so impressive. And she was a bench scientist, did research and development in areas of infectious disease, ophthalmology, oncology, and neurology, did clinical research operations, project and program management, business development, consulting. Cal, you did it all. And then after all that, in 2019, you left your full-time clinical research operations, started your own business, Tranquil Heart Wellness, LLC. And that focuses more on overall health, wellness, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, particularly working with women. Is that right? That's correct. You got it. Okay, cool. Uh, as well, my side gigs for like 20 some odd years while I worked the full time day gig. So, <laughs> wow, so impressive. So impressive. And so, in your, in your business, current business, you're a certified transformational coach and certified as a tapping to wealth coach, as well as registered yoga teacher, yoga therapist. And you've been teaching yoga for about 20 years alongside all of this stuff. Right. Yeah, actually not 25 now. <laughs> wow, so impressive. So impressive. Um, and you're also a, make, a Reiki master and teacher. And it is through Reiki, Reiki brought us together. It's right. It's a new thing. Um, yeah, what a great conversation we've already had. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, so shall we just dive in? I think we can. Yeah, let's dive right in to bite topic. In. Um, so we can talk a little bit about how we develop uh, these kinds of limiting beliefs. And I'm curious in your, in kind of, in your work with people, how has it come up for you? And, and what do you, what do you kind of tell people about how they might have developed this or how they can prevent it from being developed in others? Perhaps. A lot of this actually came up. So again, I've done all of my own work. I'll put it that way in terms sure. of doing some deep inner work to realize what were some of my limiting beliefs and how they were, as you say, how they really kind of impact our full potential and they can really get in the way of achieving the goals that we want to achieve. And sometimes, you know, they work for a certain period of time. And then you know, get to a certain period of time in your life, and it's like certain patterns of behavior just don't quite seem to work anymore. And I think that's where we start to feel stuck. Uh, uh -huh. That's where we start to really examine, okay, so what's going on? What's behind this? And a lot of times, well, I have to say most of the majority of the time, there's some type of limiting belief or block that's getting in the way that we need to excavate underneath, see what's going on there, and and see if we can move through the resistance, if you will, and move mm -hmm. through the box so that you can really, you know, take some bold action uh, to move in the direction that you want to move in. And I really look at limiting beliefs as it's, it, this is to me, it's our blind spots, right? So it's all the negative messaging, all of the negative thoughts and feelings that we tell ourselves are actually true. Hey, so I know you and I talked a little bit about this before, but to me, it's like all the messages that are handed down, right? I think it starts, starts from the parents, but it's so, there's so many levels to this, so many levels to this in terms awesome. of messages that we take all in as this is the show, this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah, lots, definitely lots of layers that come in. I think there are kind of macro, there are bigger pictures. So I'm social workers, so speaking from that lens, there are systemic and there are institutional if there's if there's institutional or systemic oppression in some ways, these limiting beliefs can be applied kind of on a general or larger basis, and those can be sneaky because we don't necessarily know where those are coming from. And then they also and and so some of that is related to we can think about like institutions like patriarchy, et cetera, 
um, that kind of have put females and women, for example, in this lesser position. And so I think that in many ways, there are certain kinds of these negative beliefs that women hold, not really even realizing, you know, that it initially kind of developed from these bigger systems and institutions was over time and, you know, throughout time has been passed down and passed down generationally. Oh, so, so then when it's passed down generationally, it can, then I think this is why it's so important to have these conversations now, because a lot of times I feel like we just walk around without really realizing why we think the way we do, why we believe what we believe. It's just kind of like, well, cause I do, but then it's so, so I, I think it takes time. It, it's important to examine those so that we then can intervene mm -hmm. and realize, Hey, guess what? I don't have to have this belief anymore. I don't, I don't have to internalize this anymore. I can make a choice about it. Exactly. It's just some key word. It's choice, right? And again, from that macro level, you're right. I mean, it's, to me, it's, it actually starts from the generational, right? It starts in our immediate tribe of however we were raised and those messages were handed down, handed down, handed down. But as you're saying, you get to that macro level, there's all other angles that come in and layer upon it, especially again, we all live in this patriarchal, as you're saying, society. And so it's really interesting. I, I find, so I work with women, um, you know, most of the clients I have are women that are in the uh, aftermath of divorce because I can speak to that population specifically because I've been through one. Um, but I talk to a lot of different women, a lot of different ages. Um, but really it comes when we start to really dissect this, you know, it, to me, it really starts from our initial tribe. You know, what were the messages that were handed down, as you said, generational, and then all of these other things that like layer into it. So it starts off, I mean, as I've got yoga in my background as well, you know, I look at it from the perspective too, is that we're little sponges from ages, or we're born to about seven, right? We're just taking in all this information where all these little inputs are coming in. And that's where we're really kind of like developing our sense of self and, you know, what we do believe and what we learn, like what behaviors are acceptable and what aren't acceptable. Right. And of course, then you're, as you said, on macro level, then there's all kinds of messages in particular for women that were, you know, that are actually handed down as well. You know, like, you know, I tell a lot of the women that I work with, you know, these messages like, you know, girls are supposed to be everything nice, like sugar and spice, mm -hmm. you know, and from my generation, a little bit older than you are, but that was like a big thing. You know, we're, we're supposed to be, you know, quiet depends on cultural too. Like I, I work with a lot of women that are in different cultures and culturally, you know, it's like women were to be, again, literally the second class citizen. Don't have a voice. We're not, you know, you're not to be able to be speaking. Now, you might not even be in the same room as a man. So it's really kind of interesting how all of these uh, different angles, if you will, can come in and create this whole narrative that we don't question, right? Because like, this is just the way it is. This is what I was doing. Right, right, um, right. <laughs> and that's so much what I'm doing here on this podcast is to be like, actually, no, it's not just, it's not just what we were taught. I mean, it has been for the past 2000 years. But prior to that, this wasn't the norm. And so a lot of what I'm doing here is is like helping people to recognize it wasn't always like this. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always like this. Um, and with the intention of encouraging hope, then it doesn't always have to be like this as well. Uh, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I think that's that's the big message that I like to give to the women that I work with, too, is that it. No, you do not have to accept that. I mean, it may be this is what was like put forth to us, but once we start feeling, and it's typically what ends up happening is you get to a point in life where you're just like, hmm, that just doesn't quite feel right. That, you know, I I am really tired of feeling this way. Plus, again, then you have societal factors. So right now, I think there's just there's so much that has been done in the past several years, I think, for women in general, uh, in terms of like opening up to like more body acceptance. That's such a huge, huge one in terms of like how we are supposed to look, you know? Uh, sure. And so I think that that's opening, you're seeing more and more commercials where you're showing women of every shape, you know, color, size, whatnot, all together as to, you know, we need to embrace all of us, not just what was the typical, you know, I need to look like, you know, a size zero or two, the Barbie figure um, that was literally what was with, with what this a size zero two, but with certain other proportions. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Not just that. 
Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's grow narrow, but then grow wide in certain, to certain areas. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, the, what is point, that has really shifted. 24, 36 uh, used to be the measurements they always said, but that was the ideal, you know, uh, yeah. honey measurements to have. So it's, yeah. it's pretty interesting. But yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, it's a really great topic to talk about. And, sure. you know, I, you know, I, t I, again, I go back to when I'm dealing with my clients, I give them a lot of examples so that they can get a picture because of which I don't understand where this came from. And so we'll do a lot of work to like address maybe the inner child. We'll do some visualizations to kind of go back in time to see like, okay, you know, what was it like when you were growing up? Like, what were the messages that you remember that kind of came down uh, from maybe your parents or care caretakers, or even maybe from your siblings and might not necessarily be your parents. It could be, you know, the teachers, whoever you were, again, in your little community that would give you um, a direction, so to speak. And I, I love telling this one story. So if you don't mind, I'd love to tell this. I, I always tell this story uh, about the child and the spilled milk story is really what it comes down to. And, um, you know, because it's sneaky. A lot of these, you know, limiting beliefs can be their, their blind spots, right? They can go oh, spots. I was going to say this is sneaky. I'm holding on to that. I'm going to hold on to that sneaky. because Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they literally are. They're like, Go ahead. underneath this, they're sneaky. You don't even realize they're there. And so I tell the story of, you know, picture the child that's maybe about five or maybe even six years old that spills a glass of milk. And the parent comes back with, how many times have I told you to hold on to your glass with two hands? Look what you just did. It spilled all over the place. Now I got to clean this up. I spent good money on it. And depending on the family dynamic, you know, it could even be that the child gets, you know, sent to bed with like out any dinner. I'm, I am not saying that this is like a true story. I'm just saying that you can sure, examples could be a story. Uh, and so, you know, sit back and think about how this child now has absorbed, right? So now you've got a heightened parent, right? They're in like, I talk a lot about fight, flight, and freeze. So the stress okay. response, and this is not to blame the parent. They could have had like, a completely stressed out day. Maybe they got multiple children that they're tending to. Who knows what's going on in their life? Sure. The way it was presented was in this heightened, angry, you know, maybe not the most pleasant kind of voice. And this child now is absorbing all of this information, right? And so, you know, I, I always ask my clients, I'm like, so what do you think messages were actually like, you know, passed on? You know, what, what did that child kind of take in at that moment? And so we'll, we'll dialogue about that and we'll, you know, come up with the common threads that come up are, I, you know, I can't make any mistakes, right? I'm not good enough as I am. You know, I, I need to be perfect at all times, you know, and maybe, maybe I feel like I, I'm not deserving. I, it's a, I'm not deserving of love or whatever if I make a mistake. So there's a whole cascade of messages that could have actually been absorbed by the child and again this is not the parent's intent right sure no no oh, you're not good enough it's just that maybe they're just having a bad day but if there's repetition on this right and now we're taking this all in and then this gets layered and layered and layered upon because again we've got as you say in the macro level now we've got all these other inputs coming in right we've right got all these societal institutional cultural whatever the the uh cascade of uh layering can happen we take it all in. And so now it's like, it's proof, right? It's now it's like, oh my gosh, they were right. I didn't deserve. And now somebody else is telling me I don't deserve, you know? And then there's all it of them. It. Right? And I mean, so then it's like, now we got to estimate. But so I give that example because it's, it, it, this is where you can say it's sneaky, right? Because as adults, we may not even remember any of what happened in our child. Maybe we do right. really lots and lots of that. Yeah, but initially you might not remember any of that until you start to really do a lot of your own like deep inner work to really estimate and see like, gosh, yeah, man, you know, that's that's where that came from. Right. Right. And then once you do that, you're you can kind of release from it and be like, okay, that's where that came from. I can give that some love. I can give my child self that, you know, love for that time period. It's kind of kind of a way of repairing and healing and then going forward we can kind of choose something else is the as the ultimate yeah but your point about sneaky <laughs> very sneaky and so i think okay so one it's sneaky and then two to your point like 
not everyone can go back in time and remember. And I'll use my kind of my own example, which brought me to like, okay, but maybe it's not just about specific events. Maybe there's something that's a more collective internalization of these messages. And so the example was when I was developing this podcast, talk about beliefs about worthiness coming up. Am I good enough? Um, do I have enough you know, knowledge about this? And it brought me to a point that and as the pressure cooker kept going, as I was getting closer to wanting to release this, my uh, anxiety went up and the pressure I put on myself went up. And I really got to a moment of kind of a crisis to some extent. And you had met, you some sense of think about this kind of earlier on. I'm not sure what it was, but it gets to this point. So I kind of got to this crisis point and I couldn't put my finger on it. And all of a sudden I was like, perfectionism it was like, thing, you know, lights went off and oh, gosh, I had like, all the grips of it. The reason I'm also saying this for her people too, is to know that like, I'm a social worker. I was in school. I studied this. I have clients, you know, that I work with, um, you know, as a clinical social worker and still it was sneaky for me. It's like, yes, I know I struggle with perfectionism from time to time, but this, how it just kind of, I thought, you know, I have it under wraps. I got it. I'm a confident, cool woman. I got, you know, I know my thing all good. And then boom. It just kind of was like, whoa, yeah. you don't just have it. Like, this is something you need to look at and you need to actually address. And in looking back on my childhood and thinking about that, I'm pretty self-reflective. And because of the work that I do, I can't think of any, you know, sort of traumatic event that was the source of this. Um You know, it's, it's not even a putting a finger on it. And what I was thinking about more and more is that, you know, we think about women and men pay differences, wage differences, for example, or you think about classroom dynamics, who gets called on, who doesn't get called on kind of thing. And what I hypothesize that is in some way is that women are more likely to feel this a sense of inadequacy and needing to over then do or over prove or over explain or over whatever it might be just to just by kind of virtue of the messages we get from society, at least thus has the, the messages. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree. I could not agree more. You know, to me, for me, the big aha, or well, I should say when I had my explosion, I went into uber perfectionism mode is when I went through my divorce. In mm. that, um, it was really, so not to, I know, I'm not here to blame and shame. <laughs> I'm not here to blame and shame my ups like you want okay. I'm not here to blame and shame my dad because, but those are the two men that in my life, literally, I there were certain events that happened that put me into this place. It was like there was a there was a little kernel or a seed of perfectionism inside of me from early on in childhood. Again, as I do more, the more inner work yep. you do, the more you can actually see this. And so there were certain events that in my childhood really like fostered that perfectionism. But going through my divorce really was like to me the topper. Um, and I, I literally got to a point was like, oh my gosh, I literally was questioning, am I not good enough? Am I, am I not pretty enough? Am I not strong enough? You know, and there was a lot of blame and shame, like it was all my fault. And so yeah. I, was like, I literally had this limiting belief that said, you're not lovable unless you're perfect. Right. And so and I didn't even recognize that that was really what was going on inside of me at the time. Sure. If I went again, this is what I see. They're sneaky. I didn't even realize that was going on at the time. I just was like, put your head down to the grindstone. This is what you need to do. And like Uber survival mode. But perfectionism was like the whole round work. You know, that was it. That was like, really, you know, I'm driving down the perfection lane right now with my head down because I was in survival mode. And seriously, it took a very long time for me to actually like start to see that. And, you know, it, this is where the inner work. Um, for yeah. me, it was when I started doing yoga and meditating that I started to recognize yeah. that, oh my gosh, like all of my validation was kind of external resources right it was that was the only way that i felt good enough right it was like right 
perfect. And then to validate their perfectionism, it was somebody from the externally would have to like, let me know. Otherwise I didn't, I didn't really believe it. And so when you start to really, yeah, peel back the layers of the onion, so to speak, and you can yeah. um, pioneer it, stay deep. But the more that you do that and peel back that onion and start to get quiet and go inside and start to really look and see like, what's actually happening, that was to me, that was the kickstart to say, okay, you know what? I don't have to be perfect to be loved. Right. Are there still moments where perfection may commit? Yes, but I recognize them so much quicker and I can address them so much quicker now as well. But to get there initially, again, to me, and I, and I tell this to my plans all the time, you do the inner work. It's so important to get quiet. Right. To, to listen inside. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so important to quiet and listen inside. Now, I also know, though, that people are like, ah, I might not. They might not want to have all, spend all the time getting quiet and going inside, potentially. You know, they might not want. But so there's also what we're talking about today are things that people can, okay, start noticing. You just start noticing. Just start observing. Being curious about yourself is another approach to have it. Because I think it's it's cautious not to then get judgy about, ju you know, you can also get judgy about the fact that you are doing the perfectionist and stuff, perfectionist and stuff. And then it's a, you know, kind of a, a cycle. So I think, oh. right? So, you mean the so I also want listeners to be like, <laughs> yeah. Right. The should too guilt cycle that we get into. Yeah, yeah exactly. We go on and on about that too. Again, when you first start, right, your inner critic comes up because that, you know, the protection, you know, is that protectionism, protection mechanism, I shouldn't say, your inner critic. But I think the more that you can come at that with a perspective of love, again, this, it's a journey, right? This takes time. It's a process. And most people aren't going to see it. There's no judgment there. They're not going to see it until they have something happen where they're like either a heart breaking moment, some kind of heart opening moment, or they literally get to a point where I'm just, I don't know how I feel anymore. I don't even know who I am anymore. I just feel stuck. And it's typically when, again, when I see, start to see clients is that, and I can't really put my finger on it, Sydney, but you know, I, I just feel stuck. And that'll be like the, that's their classic, I just feel stuck. And so then it's like, okay, let's start to, let's dig, right? I feel stuck in the month. Let's start to dig under that and start to get into it. But you're so spot on, you know, Clay, in terms of like, there can be a lot of judgment that comes in and Just for having it, for even yeah. experiencing it. Exactly. But we just might want to talk about it because there's no judgment. We all, as I'm saying, I'm a social worker, for goodness sake. I studied this, like, no judgment. You, this is, that's the whole thing. We've got to release that so that we can actually do the work. And that's why, you know, I, I hope to give people the messages and encourage over time, this curious approach, be curious. Like it's not a judgment thing. Just start noticing, okay, you know, and, and perhaps I'll learn something here today where I might be like, ah, that kind of, maybe that's, maybe I've been experiencing a little bit of that. And maybe just by seeing it, just by shedding light on it, you know, the darkness goes away. Bingo. I mean, to me, it all begins with awareness, right? That is the exactly. starting point is that you right. have to start to see it, become aware of it. Because once you have awareness, then you can start to address it. Exactly. So sneaking and it's in your blind spot, you know, right. like, maybe I just continue on whatever, you know, patterns of behavior you're used to. And, and I, you know, I've applied sort of like, again, that, you know, 60s and I'm like, look at, you got to think of it from this person. And they'll get down on themselves. Like, why aren't I getting this? I'm like, all right, wow, well, take a step back. You, look at the old fashioned record albums, right? Vinyl. We'll go to the vinyl things. The grooves in the record are deep. Oh, yeah. right? That's 60 some odd years where you've been behaving in a certain way. It right. may take some time, right? To like lay down some new tracks. You might need to break that record. And so you, you have to be, I think, really patient with yourself too and give yourself a lot of grace to say, Look at this, this isn't going to be the two snatch wipe around the mouth and I got it tomorrow. No, you know, it's going to take noticing and that awareness and then practice. Like, what? So then, how do I reframe it? Right. So, again, uh, what, what do I do next? Start to reframe your language. How are you talking to yourself? Right. Are you still judging yourself? Oh, that here it is again. And then I beat myself up because I made it in perfectionism again. Or maybe you say, oh, yep, here it is again. And mm -hmm. kind of about it, 
right? Give ourselves a little bit of grace and giggle. Yep, there it is again. And then, you know, I'm just, I do a lot of tapping. It's one of the tools that I use. Mm. I just do this. I'm like, I still do it. And I'll still have more to grow. And I'll constantly growing. Oh, of course. We all have lives. And I'm just like, okay, get happened. And I'll just tap on one point. I'll tap on my collarbone. Well, I'm just going to all tell you a Okay, so just give yourself some love right now. Give yourself some love and just really kind of move through it very quickly so that I'm not holding on to it. Because mm-hmm. that's what ends up happening, right? Then we're in our head swirling with it, ruminating. Oh, do I know or do I know? Five hours yesterday. Five hours yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Just round and around. Did I get anywhere? Did I, was I more productive after I got on myself for the fact that I wasn't productive? Did it? No? No. Yeah. I get out of the house. It was like, you need to change your environment. You need to, we need to switch it off. And I did switch it off early enough. That's the thing is I didn't intervene earlier enough. I just was, oh, you know. It was like, such a good it. point that you just brought up too is like change your environment. You know, um, there's a whole bevy of tools that you can use. And one of them is, look, get up. I like to get out and go on nature. When I start, you know, getting into that, I'm like, I'm like uh, okay, I need to get up. I need to get away from my desk. I need to go outside, get in nature, whatever the case may be, or, you know, whatever. Again, I do a lot of yoga, meditation, even breathing. But as you say, just get up. All I need to do is go into another room, take a couple of breaths, you know, see what's going on. And then come back in. And I think the more important piece here, and again, this is no judgment here as well, is after we recognize it as not to beat ourselves up, why didn't I recognize it quicker? Because that can happen too, right? Then we spin on that. Why didn't I recognize it quicker? That's what I mean. That's what I mean. (laughs) That's what happened yesterday, you know, such a learning. And it is is a journey. It is an ebb and flow, you know? It's like, okay, yeah, this was like a month, month and a half ago. I was like, perfectionism. I was like, got it. Figured it out. Yeah, I was like, all right, this point forward, I'm leaving it behind. Well, it did it work for, you know, I worked on it for a little bit. I got a little bit and then you're, right, you know, here is yesterday and it's here. So just as you said, it does take time to redevelop it. We're neurologically wired. It's like, it's become pattern. It's become a pattern in our brains. So we, we kind of need to unpattern ourselves um, in a lot of ways. And the thing about limiting Belief. So I guess I'm just going to say the uh, definition of it since I never even did at the beginning, but it's basically a state of mind, a way of thinking, a belief or a judgment about oneself that restricts somebody in some way. Um, and, you know, you point on the beginning, it can, and sometimes it can be adaptive. Sometimes it helps us. And in fact, in our youth, in our childhood, when this first, you know, first developed, it probably was helpful for us. Mm-hmm. And then we realize over time, it's no longer helpful for me. And then that's when it needs to be adjusted. And why they have been is often it can be based in fear, which is another thing that we haven't really talked about, but like, that's how it is. It maintains itself because there's some, it was useful for us at one point in time to protect against whatever our fear was. Being judged, not being punished, being not being ostracized, left out of a friend group, you know, wherever it was that we were kind of fearful of. And then that fear that pops up will enact it again. It'll make it happen again. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. Fear is the big one. That that is exactly it. That is the main emotion that holds us back. And we're afraid. And so once we're in that fear-based modality. You know, it, it, it blocks, it cuts us off, it can cut us right off at the ankles. And so, you know, I think the big thing here is really what a bottom line it comes down to is how do we love ourselves more fully? So, so. And, and I talk a lot about that, you know, with the women that I work with, it's like, how do we get to a place where we can truly just love ourselves and accept ourselves just as we are? Because we have, and you know, this too, is that we're multidimensional beings we the, and we own every single side that could possibly be out there. And says, so are they dialed up or are they dialed down? You know, right. those characteristics, traits, et cetera, and then what feelings go along with them. And so it's really finding that happy balance. You know, because sometimes you know, I go back to, again, for me and my generation, it was like, don't be angry. If you're a woman, don't be angry. Ah, okay. You know, anger, you know, unacceptable for you to be angry. And, you know, I think about, I go back to the institution we were talking earlier about is that, you know, I kind of played small, you know, I played very small. This comes back to childhood too. You know, it was like, my father was like very authoritarian in his uh, approach in terms of parenting at that time. 
And, um, you know, his, whatever he said was the law. This, this was the rule, you know, and you didn't go against that. And so for me, it ended up manifesting with me very much playing small, you know, right. especially because most of the jobs I had, it was always the males that had the, the higher positions, right? They were the authorities. And so I would shrink myself, right? Uh, and, you know, again, I think of other examples. Sure. A lot when we were kids, um, I, you know, a father was stationed at a lot of different places. And, we, you know, I was bullied a lot. I was very tiny, you know, uh, very, very tiny, the, the tiniest person probably in the class for many years. And so I just kind of, you know, the new kid, you always kind of get picked on. And so I kept converting into a chameleon, if you will, so that I got yes. in. Now, some of those qualities serve me well. Right. You know, like being adaptable and flexible and whatnot. Sure. The side, the negative side is that I tended to then play small so that I could fit in. And so again, then you have layered that on with the kind of like the male authority figure. And, you know, it really didn't serve me well. Even though I was successful, you know, in, in what I was doing in terms of my career, uh, my full-time career, I still didn't feel like I was really able to be my full authentic self. Oof. And so that, again, is, again, I think that these sneaky limiting beliefs hold us back from being our true, most true, pure, authentic selves. And so, you know, I've spent a lot of, again, a lot of time, a lot of work working on just feeling fully authentic in my skin and loving it no matter what it looks like, right? No matter what it looks like. Because I used to be, if I made a mistake, oh my gosh, talk about and illuminating in the Shunshin guilt cycle. And I think, you know, women in general, we judge ourselves just, we're ruthless in terms of that shun shame guilt. We are. You know, mistakes are a big one. And so I always say, you know, we got to learn to love ourselves at core, right? And so I, it's really, I go, I could go on and on about this because I had a conversation the other day with another um, woman we were talking about. She said, well, you know, but is it self-care, self-love? And I was like, you know what? It's not. Because I can go to the gym five days a week and still hate my body. True. Right? And so to me, it's an entree in. Self-care is an entree into self-love. And so I think, you know, that's, it's, that's a good first step uh, is to really just start honoring and nurturing yourself in a lot of different ways. Again, this will help with the limiting beliefs. We're nurturing ourselves in that way, too, to just be fully accept ourselves and not judge ourselves if we fall into I fell into perfectionism yesterday. Tony, right? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly right. But that's why you know I want people to know that that's why it's so important for people to to understand. Like this is a systemic. These are things that come in over time that we develop. You know, there's a social, there's whole theories around how these things are made and formed. And so I hope that gives people a little bit of a distance so they don't have to take it so personally to then be hard on themselves. They can understand, okay, no, this is a process that occurs yeah. and, you know, I'm a, I'm a part of that process and this is how it happened and, you know, have a little distance and then, so they don't get hard. So like I didn't, so I'm not getting harder on myself for yesterday. I'm letting yesterday go. I understand where it came from and how I did it. You know, I finally got myself outside and turned off that rule going around. But um, yeah, that's why I think it's so important to, again, bring light on this uh, so that people can have an understanding. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like, and like I said, I, I, I could give more anecdotes as well, just in terms of, yeah, again, it all layers and layers me. It, right. You know, totally. Again, yeah. if you go back to my generation, it was like women, you know, it was like, you're actually just going to get married. Your husband's going to take care of you. Oh. My mom was very prophetic. She was like, but you need to go to school because you need to be able to like make your own money and be able to take care of yourself. Who knew how prophetic that would be <laughs> years later and, Burner. you know, going through a divorce. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting, again, depending on and what generation, all of that. It all just kind of like goes back to that source of like where this all comes from. But now we can just see it all over the place. And I think what I love that I think about it, generation, is that there's so many more avenues to like become more awake to this, right? Um, 
you know, the internet, we didn't have the internet, you know, didn't even have it when I was literally like, kind of like just getting that when I was going through my divorce. So it's really kind of interesting to, to go back in time to see like what tools were even available to us. And I think like, this is great, you know, having this type of platform to be able to like, again, speak what's going on so that more people can say, yeah, you know what, Ooh, wow, that is happening to me. And right. you know, what kind of tool can I take away then or nugget that I can take away that's going to help me maybe on my journey. So truly, really yeah, important point. very important point, because you were really I, like prior generations prior to the internet, basically were really isolated. If we think about it that way, you only have the info that you had that you literally had physical access to. People don't even realize that, you know, that it didn't happen. You, you, we couldn't be doing this right now. We couldn't even be having this conversation and then also be sharing it on a global way. So people were really stuck in terms of and feeling isolated and, and not having this forum. So, so that's right. And, you know, my generation is, you know, the first, maybe the, you know, first, second that can, that we also feel safer to speak about it because you you just couldn't back in other in other time frames and I think that's important for my generation and younger to recognize that this as well that this is you know our moms for those who are my generation our moms for example might not have had this opportunity or when it wouldn't have been safe or okay to to speak in this kind of free way so um yeah. It's amazing. I mean, they, we haven't had women haven't had the right to vote, you know, for <laughs> let's go back. You know, we can Indeed. how long did it take us to get that? I mean, so, I, are we, do we need to talk? Do we even have another episode? Because I could get in exactly we could get into another episode. So all right, I will we'll pause, push the pause button because I'm um, a whole journey on that one as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man, maybe we'll do another one. Yeah, maybe we'll do one on on being a woman throughout time yeah like because that's I you read just something you said though that i think is really really important for sure. you it's you said being the observer mm. and so i you know i've had clients ask me well, how do i become the observer with this negative self-talk and one of the one of the tools that we use a lot that i use a lot is give her a name <laughs> you know yeah. it's like give her a name and so i have you know i have one fight right now where she calls her inner critic big bad beatrice i love that and love so that. when she when she starts to hear all this negative you know chatter she'll be like oh it's big bad beatrice again you know and so again we can then it's a way it's a tool to kind of like get outside of ourselves now we can start to become more right observer of like what's going on um so i think it's such a great tool, and a lot of women have used it. They're like, oh, they they told me the feedback I received from that is it works wonders because it then it, it like short circuits then it shouldn't say guilt cycle again, whatever swirl or rumination we're in because now we're recognizing ah, it's just this. Yeah, we, it's just the inner. It's the critic, right? It's the inner critic. It's the inner critic. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sure. Yeah, thank you for for pointing that out again because that objectivity that's really important. To be able to intervene. If we take everything so personally, we're so hard on ourselves, there's like no wiggle room to get in there to like dis, you know, get a little space from it. So I love that. Thank you for bringing that up again. Big bad, bad Beatrice. Those big bad Beatrices. Big bad Beatrices. Or big bad Berts. I don't know. Or guys. Big bad Berts. Don't you know a lot about? A lot about women stuff, but I don't want to dismiss that men also can feel these things. I don't want it. Yeah, it's not the way. I totally agree. I just tend to work my client base as women, so that's why I'm always referring to. But you're absolutely right. Totally, totally. I just wanted to point that out there because it's not, it's not even. You know, yeah, everyone can kind of um, experience this. So, kind of in looping back to maybe bring us back to. Uh, okay, so some of the common limiting beliefs. I'll just go there are like i'm not good enough just to circle back i'm not worthy enough don't have enough experience there are kind of some other ones with that and those lead into then what pop culture now is talking about things like imposter syndrome things like perfectionism um there's probably others that and you've encountered too in your work with folks but i just wanted to make that link is that okay we have these underlying core beliefs in social work and the in clinical talk it's called these core beliefs that we have and then in, they manifest in these syndrome ways 
um, such as perfectionism or imposter syndrome type of thing. I mean, I, you know, imposter syndrome, you, you brought one right up, imposter syndrome, right? That's, uh, you know, that's, that's a biggie. I think a lot of us, especially when you move into, I know I, I felt that when I jumped into being a solopreneur, right? Uh -huh. I always had like a full-time day gig or whatever. Not to say that um, maybe some imposter syndrome came along with that. At certain points, probably when I was newer to job a little bit, well, do I have a nurse too? But I think with age, you kind of like move through that. But I simply felt it when I jumped into, you know, being my own boss and trying to put myself out there in a very authentic way. So then I think that's where, again, the fear comes in, even the perfectionism kind of runs back in. And you're right. You know, it's like you get, you kind of don't really feel like you had enough, enough experience. And what I have found is that and that's when people do like, oh, I didn't take another course. I didn't take another course. I didn't take another course because they're afraid to put themselves out there. Or again, fear of somehow I'm going to be judged. Right, right, right. And I'm half and half on saying this, but I'm going to say it though. I do think this is something that that does impact women at a higher rate than men, it, it, because I've seen men my age, for example, who are entrepreneurs, etc., and you know have the Instagram and have these businesses and whatever, and they're you know sometimes they're responsible. Well, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. You just get to put yourself out there. No, no procrastination. Just, you know, just do it. And I'm like, yeah, right. Just do it. Just commit, you know? And I, it's like, okay, then there's things bubble up to all these things in front of me, right? That I don't, I'm not sure they're quite, if they know the feeling of that sometimes, right? That I agree with you. I got a patriarchal so. society, right? I mean, men have been in the power positions, if you will. For and for Michigan. well, not forever, but in our in our lifetime, they've been in the the positions of power. So I think again, it just comes down to women are judged on so many different levels. Wait, I don't know if you saw the Barbie movie, but I like America Ferrera's monologue in that. If you've not seen it, you've got to watch that piece of it because it really does it so hard. They, she basically explains how difficult it is to be a woman and how we literally live on the razor's edge. Don't be this old, but don't be that. Right. And so there's always this line of like, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged. We're going to be judged. And so what we do, self-protection, we're going to judge ourselves as, well, if I'm not ready. Right, 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 right. I don't need, I'm not, no, you know. And so you're right. We don't just, they just blast through and just going to jump in two feet and do it. If it works great, if it doesn't, I learn something and I go on from it. Totally. You know, I, I hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. But then you also can get in the cycle of being like, why, why can't I just jump in it? Oh, okay. I think everybody gets it now. We now we have to be the top it. Right, right, right. Um, okay. So to kind of wrap it up here with what we can do about these things. So you talk, you talk about a couple of things. One is, is learning to get a little bit of space, taking a curious standpoint, kind of gaining some objectivity, naming that big bad Beatrice of yours, getting some distance from it. What else have you found to be helpful in your work with people? You know, I get a lot of reframing. So that's another, you know, thing that you can do. I, I like clients do a lot of journaling. Um just to kind of like, what are your thoughts and feelings? For me, I do a lot of uh, emotional freedom techniques. So I do, I weave in a lot of my other modalities and, and tools and techniques so that we can actually like work it through the nervous system. Because I literally, we hold a lot of this within the nervous system, right? Fear yes. is um, being triggered about certain things. So how can we come back into a more grounded place? Because when we are grounded, then we can see things more clearly as well. Uh, but inner work is big. Uh, journaling would be a big one. Reframing. If you've got a negative negative thought or feeling, how or where where it even came from, you know, like sure. oh, this right. happened. How can you flip that around? Like, what's a positive spin that you can put on that then, so that you can actually shift that belief into something that's more positive? Reframe it. So I think that's another really good tool. Is like, how can I reframe even how I'm talking about it? That's huge. I think that's a big one. Latitude. Gratitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cornerstone practice is just to start feeling grateful. Um, Self-care. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge in terms of 
little ways to nurture yourself. And it doesn't have to be like, I got to go and spend out a lot of money because, you know, a lot of, now a lot of women I'm working with that they're in the after method of where finances might be a big, huge issue for them. Uh, and so it can be simple as I'm just going to take a warm bath with nobody else around and put on some nice mm-hmm. or a cup of tea, you know, with, you know, inside of that. So really simple things that you can do to create more of that, again, space, quality space, make things so to quicker yourself. And, and showing yourself, I, you know, you mentioned before, like, going outside of ourselves for validation. I think we also go outside of ourselves, you know, for love, but we need to learn how to love ourselves first, which is a lot of the core of a lot of the, or the challenge, a lot of the core limiting beliefs is around like, you know, loving and caring for yourself. So I think coupling those self-care activities mm-hmm. also with mantras or what you're speaking to yourself can also be you know, coupling it with what you're speaking and how you're saying, you know, how you're speaking to yourself as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. And my, you know, my, cl- my client the other day brought up this technique and I'm, I'm doing it alongside them for a week, which is every morning. Well, two things. One, you brush your teeth with the opposite hand that you typically brush it with. This is for neuro, new neuropathies. Oh, I love it. Yes. Found that line somewhere. So brush your teeth with the opposite hand. For me, I'm right. So it's going to be my, it's my left. And say, I love you to yourself in the mirror 10 times and do it every day. And I'm like, that sounds great. I'm going to do that because when do I, like, when do I ever really say to myself, I love myself? It's like, oh, you know, taken for granted, kind of. So I just thought this was such a cool and quirky and fun thing to try out. But it it reminded me of like coupling the behavior, whatever that's going to be, the self care, the math, or, you know, with how we're speaking to ourselves. And that is actually a very powerful, powerful tool. I can tell you though, some of the women that I have worked with though are scared to death to do that because they do not like their physical appearance at all. So it's really difficult. But the more they do it, you know, we start off with like, as you say, 10 times, work up to maybe like two minutes, keep going at that. And it starts to break apart. There's also, have you ever heard of the Polo? It's a whole line. Prayer and it's a it's a prayer on forgiveness and it's a really great way to like work on like a level of self forgiveness mm. and it's really you know just again you can look in the mirror um, and just say these bits or four statements it's basically um, I'm sorry please forgive me thank you and I love you and you yes. just keep repeating that over and over again and again it's just a way to like start bringing in more of the because a lot of times, again, we're holding on to stuff that we don't want to forgive ourselves about. So it's another big component of this. Yeah, they, um, being able to forgive ourselves and move some of that out, so to speak, move some of that energy out so that we can bring in more self-love. Yeah, and absolutely. There's lots of t- different yeah, points. At point. And I think support, right? What, you know, getting in, surrounding yourself with more women or men that that get it, that are like ready to kind of like up level themselves, if you will, like take themselves to the next best version, more empowered version of themselves it is because misery loves company, right? And True. so we can get to a point where we start to like surround ourselves with people that are getting that and, and want to support and uplift each other. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. So getting into that kind of community so you've got you're hearing it, you're sharing it and hearing it with one another. And you don't feel so all alone. Like, is it just me? Like, am I the only one that's thinking this or behaving this way or whatnot? Now you've got, you know, su- support in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I also am thinking about divine support mm-hmm. as well. And Quan Yin came to mind. We were talking about the, the forgiveness of oneself. And Quan Yin is a great um, being uh ascended master to call upon for specifically for um self-compassion and self-love and so that's she she's another tool non-human being that can be helpful as well and so asking you know her to assist with it you don't have to know how or what but asking asking her in fact i think that's funny and over there yeah Still on, you know, yeah, yeah. So that's another yeah, yeah. we can do. So, so we've got a lot going on here. Recognizing it, one kind of adjusting how we speak to ourselves, coupling 
um, kind of self-care loving actions along with words, you know, having a sense of community, even such of these kind of online communities certainly work. I could be very helpful. Well, um, so we've kind of got a lot of things that people can, can use and start kind of working on to help address some of these negative thoughts. Ew, absolutely. And, you know, and again, if they need help, then there's, there's a lot of again, professionals, right? That you can always go to and tap on a little bit and say, you know what? I, I just can't get there on my own. And yeah, that's, absolutely. And that's okay, too. You know, again, sometimes we don't want to know, oh, well, yeah, maybe seems weak if they ask for help. Absolutely not. That's where you're actually showing a lot of strength that you're willing Courage. to do whatever you need to do to, like, move yourself forward in a really positive way. And absolutely. It's a beautiful thing to do. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Cindy, for saying that. As a social guy, I'm not saying that word, but I otherwise might say that kind of thing. So, yes, thank you for remembering and saying that. Certainly, but people can reach for help if they need it. And how about you, Cindy, if, if people want to connect with you for the work that you kind of do? Do you do it locally? Do you do it virtually? What do you, you know... Yeah, sure. So, um, so the name of my business is Tranquil Heart Wellness. So I have a website, www.tranquilheartwellness.com. It's all one word. Um, you can reach out to me that way. I'm on Insta, Facebook as well. Uh, yeah, so I just, I give out free consultations. You can get a full 60 minutes with me if you want. Just kind of talk through like where you're at. I have a bevy of services. Mostly I do a lot of coaching one-on-one or I have groups still that I do as well. The groups are very small. It's for women uh, and there it's no more than five and it's virtual. So everything is like virtual, you know, so I don't have to worry about keys back to go in person. Uh, so I offer that. Plus I still do a lot of yogi things. So I, you know, do hot yoga sessions, yoga therapy sessions, EFT sessions. If you want to just do an EFT session and Reiki. Reiki is can be done in person or um, you can actually do it via Zoom as well because there is no, you know, the time space, there is no difference there. That's right. But I think the best way to contact me would be just go to the website. You can um, book a call with me anytime or just get more information. That would probably be well, the best way to get, a, get in touch with me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, for being here today. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I look forward to to having you back again on the Source Method. So thank, thank you so much. It's so much. You're welcome.